they called mad. I ain't really have a partner. Now I feel like I found my partner, you know? Doctor Doom. Help me, Doctor, please! The villain took on many forms. Rap sees very few supervillains. It's littered with flawed protagonists and faceless corpses, figures who are far from perfect but at the end of the day want to be perceived in the best possible light with the most amount of fame and acclaim. Mad Villainy was a group that reveled in the antithesis of this. The group was a collaboration between two of the most secretive and unique men in music, Madlib and MF Doom. MF has, and most likely will, remain one of the most elusive figures in hip-hop history. Leading up to Mad Villainy, Daniel Dumoulin was yet to don the supervillain moniker, instead going by his stage name Zev Love X in his first rap group causing much damage. Dumoulin would come by turbulent in a couple of years. His brother, a close friend and producer of KMD, abruptly passed away in 1993. To add to that, the label the group was on, Elektra, dropped them due to some less than advertiser friendly album art. This instilled the distrust Doom had for big music labels, as from then on, he would really only work with small, independent ones, giving him the creative freedom he so desired. What followed was a half-long decade retreat for our protagonist, most likely listening to jazz and sipping tea like the true Brit he is. However, by 1999 he was reborn, this time donning a metal mask, a meaner physique but still sharp as ever with the pen, releasing his first solo album, Operation Doomsday, on his new alter ego, MF Doom. Doom was always unique to the rap game, as he rapped from the perspective of someone else, a fictional villain taking obvious inspiration from the Marvel character Doctor Doom. Fast forward just two years, his fledgling record label Fondalum folded, leaving Doom to retreat once more, completely off the grid, even for Doom's standards, and thus hopes that another record remains slim as ever. Madlib born Otis Jackson Jr. will go down as arguably one of the greatest and most unique producers of all time. Working from the likes of Freddie Gibbs to Jay Diller, he really is one of the most legendary producers out there, but there was a time in his life where producing another hip hop album was almost completely off the cards. At that time, choosing to use his talent on his one man jazz fusion band, Yesterday's Quintet. The producer was estranged from his genre. This was to the dismay of his failing record Stones Throw, who desperately needed a hit. Madlib did achieve great critical success with his animated alter ego Quasimoto, with his album The Unseen. However, like most albums he produced, the quality wasn't reflective of his commercial success, and fading into non-existence still painfully loomed over Stone's Throw. Founded in 1996, the entire business model almost relied on centering around Madlib. To be closer to their prized asset, they'd recently moved from San Francisco to LA. But this didn't sway Madlib on a return to the genre by himself, still preferring to work under his alter ego. The duo combining seemed to be a long shot. Both men were eerily reclusive about their personal life and whereabouts. This was the early 2000s after all, where it was much harder to get a hold of artists for collaborations. Thus, the chances of the two meeting in one room were next to non-existent. However, like all good comic book villains, there must be a tipping point in the origin story. One where against all odds, the unexpected happens. Here he became Doctor Doom. It all started after Stone's Throw executives had tried everything to get Madlib back into rap, even throwing around the idea of getting his first group, Loot Pack, back together for a reunion album. But nothing stuck. The label was on its last legs and were almost completely out of capital. Stranded in LA, it seemed like Stone's Throw were destined to fade into obscurity like Fondalum not two years ago. They weren't able to even afford an office space. The company's founder, Chris Manak, better known for his stage name, Peanut Butter Wolf. Yeah, it was like the early 2000s. These were, these were different times. Operated out of a rented house in Washington, with Madlib making all his beats out of an Eisenhower era bomb shelter. So this is literally a bomb shelter that was made in the 50s, I guess. When the a layer fit for two supervillains. Destiny would throw Stone's throw a lifeline in the form of an LA Times feature for Madlib. When pressed for a dream collaboration, he gave two names, Jay Diller and MF Doom. Madlib had named his price for returning to hip hop, 
and it was up to the executives to make it happen. J-Lib's champion sound was quickly fast forward to the production stage, but complications rose when it came to the latter. How do you contact the man without a face? Someone who no one in the industry had hardly heard from before his hiatus, and someone who's remained as secretive as ever after it. Well, as it would turn out, it was almost entirely down to chance. General manager of Stonesaw at the time, Egon Alpat, had an old college friend who resided in Keensaw, Georgia, a place where the fabled Doom was said to have settled down. This friend of Egon had just so happened to have an acquaintance with Doom. Contacts were made and numbers were switched around, with a care package of some early Madlib beats being sent Doom's way, and the supervillain was open to it. But getting him to agree to hear him out was only the first hurdle, as the man himself had said multiple times, he does his rap shit for the cheddar. Meeting his management's demands was a whole different ball game. The management on Danielle's side demanded a paid flight out to LA and $1500 for three tracks. Stonestow, after paying for that flight out to LA, had virtually nothing left in the bank. Peanut Butter picked them up and drove them back to the bunker, and a standoff straight out of one of the Sunday cartoons from Adlib Samples unfolded. Doom's manager had cornered Peanut Butter Wolf in a room, confronting him about the 1500 that was promised. Meanwhile, Doom and Madlib were in the bunker, sampling some beats. A situation unfolded where if the manager had realized that Stone Store were broke, Doom would be on the first flight back to Georgia, a world robbed of an iconic collaboration, and our timeline, that less dastardly. Peanut Butter knew that he just had to buy time, as the more MF and Madlib spent together in the bunker, the higher the chance of a potential collab coming off. And as haggling transpired upstairs, thick blunt smoke and the instrumental to America's Most Blunted was being played in the bunker. And just like that, the duo knew this was meant to be. By booking a few DJ gigs, scraping together some change, and banking on a vinyl advance, Stone So just about got enough money for a $1,300 budget for their album, with the villain finally being given his $1,500 advance. What's interesting about the contract between Stone Store and Doom is that both truly believed in an anti-establishment approach when it came to music, with a 50-50 split of the proceeds after the expenses were accounted for. This is really surprising in the industry, one where labels seem to suck every penny out of the artists and cut corners at every turn. This was due to the fact that just like Doom, Peanut Butter held the same disdain for big record companies, subsequently being dropped from his big shot label after the death of his partner in the 90s. Parallel to what Doom experienced. Doom flew back out to LA and immediately started writing, using his time efficiently in order to get back to his children, going back and forth between Stone's Throw HQ and his hotel room. While at the HQ, the supervillain said this on working with Quaz. Like I would hardly see him, we're in the same house, but he's always in a bomb shelter and I'm always up on the deck writing, right? And then he'll give me another CD, I get the CD, and I'm writing, you know what I'm saying? And then he's back in the bomb shelter, so I would hardly speak to him. Like, we hardly ever, you know, we might stop and he'll burn one and we'll listen to the beat and then that's it. And then the next two days, I probably won't see him. But then I was they spoke more through telepathy than words. What made the duo work was not a clear, well thought out plan of what they were going to do. It was more just two great minds who understood each other's view on music and how they wanted to be perceived. Quickly, Madlib shifted into overdrive, with hundreds of beats being produced in a matter of weeks, with the focus from the label's point of view being put towards the Jay Diller collaboration, touted as the bigger financial and commercial success, with the Mad Villainy project acting as the weird younger brother made up of Sunday morning cartoons and obscure sci-fi references, but the second release would be put into jeopardy after Madlib's trip to Brazil. Circa 2002, he was invited to speak at the acclaimed Red Bull Music Academy in Sao Paulo. Madlib, a man of the people, relished this opportunity. Scouting out samba loops and favela classics, he could cut into a hit. Armed with his on-the-go beat-making kit, consisting of a cassette tape and an SP-303, and even with such a limited armory at his disposal, he could probably blow your favourite producer out the water. As while on this trip in his tiny hotel room, made the beats to such cult classics as Strange Ways, Raid, and of course, The Rhinestone Cowboy. 
But around those two weeks, being in this hotel room held our biggest roadblock yet. People were siphoning in and out. However, what transpired was an unnamed lowlife sneaking into the lair, burning a demo cassette of an early, yet almost finished version of the album, making his getaway back to the United States, unbeknownst to either villain. Quickly, the album was uploaded to the internet. Back then, the full implications of this were not fully explored. From Stone Soul's perspective, they thought the entire album was ruined. Sales were tank and the entire thing would be a massive money sink. What transpired was Madlib and Doom being approached at shows, fans expressing about how much they loved the album, but this love only pushed our two creators further away from the project, feeling disheartened that the work had leaked unfinished, and thus, just how supervillains do when one plan goes kaput, they move on to the next. But you haven't heard the last of Dr. Doom. Fast forward a whole year, and j -Lib flopped commercially. Doom's hiatus was eventually broken, with his incredible album Take Me To Your Leader under his three-headed alias, King Ghidorah, as well as Victor Vaughn's vaudeville villain, a foil to his Doom character. It's not known why Madlib and MF went back to their scrap project, maybe nostalgia of both realising the gold that they had at their disposal, but the duo were back. Doom immediately got back to writing, as some tracks still didn't have finished verses. Interestingly, the villain decided on redoing all his vocals on the album, and rewriting many of the lyrics, creating what would eventually become Accordion and one of my favourite tracks, Bistro. According to Wolf, on the original version of the album, Doom rapped in a really hyper, more enthusiastic voice. Then he decided to rap in a more mellow, relaxed, confident, less abrasive tone. I think he did it to make it different from all the other projects he dropped in those years. And listening to both Take Me To Your Leader and Vaudeville Villain, Mad Villainy really does stand out in Doom's discography, aided heavily by the cinematic S beats provided by Madlib. However, the final release, just like the rest of our journey, was riddled with complications. Madlib was asked by the label to redo a couple of the beats for the album, following the single releases of Money Folder. However, Quaz had forgotten some of his sample sources. Granted, these ranged from the Brazilian loot he plundered to obscure noir films. Then Doom demanded to alter some of the songs. Frustration and tempers rose yet again, and we were on the brink of the project being shelved. Alapat calmed things down, and felt the album didn't have a legitimate ending, renting the man with a metal face a $60 an hour studio, allowing him to choose from a plethora of carefully crafted Mad Lib beats, and the villain came through, concluding the album in style with a finished second verse of the rhinestone cowboy, and after almost a dozen years of fighting back against big music, the light was finally shown Doom's way encapsulated in the encore. The sample is a single millisecond from a Brazilian song, Mariana Mariana. His wordplay on the song is up there with some of his best, alluding to the subsequent leak and delay, intertwined perfectly with his first verse, which was written almost a year before the second. It sends the villains off in style, finishing their project with what MF described as his favourite song. The Finnish Mad Villainy project eventually found its ways onto store shelves on the 23rd of March 2004 to critical acclaim worldwide. A true testament to what the underground hip hop game can deliver. A collaboration between two of the genre's finest doing it their way and not compromising their sound or uniqueness in order to appeal to more people. It's either you see what the villains are cooking or don't. The masked villain only enhances the experience, making you think more about the flipbook imagery or exploits the duos are getting into, rather than the kind of chubby, balding 30 year old man in the booth. And in an era where the genre was shrouded in authenticity being at the forefront, mad villainy embraced the polar opposite, telling stories of the mad villain bistro bed and breakfast bar and grill to being wary of a girl with rancid breath. It truly exists within a league of its own, but if nothing is like Mad Villainy, that's simply because nobody is like MF Doom or Madlib. The producer's ability to create a soundscape was like no other, slicing in sound effects giving life to his music. Telephone styles, bongs rip, and old school cartoon sound effects mesh perfectly with the intricate flow MF delivers track after track. They truly embraced what made both stand out from the crowd, and made an album that has garnered cult-like status and arguably the finest album both produced in their respective careers. And remember, if you're gonna say something about the villain in the comments, it's all caps when you spell the man's name. <laughs>